Well, we're here at SSCR 24 at the, at the Copyright Committee for the World Intellectual Property Organization. And I'm talking to Carlo, and Car Carlo, how do I say, how do I say your last name? <laughs> My last name is very long. It's uh, Scolo Lavizzari, which is uh, an Italian name. Um, to keep it simple, I'm, I'm Italian by blood, uh, Swiss by birth, and South African by choice. So I have three, three uh, countries that I can call home. Wow, Italian, Swiss, Swiss and South African. That's right. Wow. Well, uh, it's Friday night. We're waiting for, I mean, not Friday. It's, it feels like a Friday, but it's, it's Wednesday night, the last day of a 10-day meeting here. We're waiting for people to come back with conclusions. But before we talk about the, uh, the negotiations, I just wonder uh, if I could ask you a few questions about yourself. You're, you're, uh, how long have you been coming to this organization? Uh, now you got me. Um, probably for about 12, 12, 13 years. Really? And so what was the yeah. first... Well, yeah, you, you represent, uh, now are you a private, a lawyer in private I'm a, practice? I'm a lawyer in private practice and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm representing here the scientific, technical and medical publishers. I started off as an um, in-house uh, lawyer to the IPA, the broader umbrella international publisher association, which perhaps you interviewed yet, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we, we talked. Um, so you you started out working for them, and so when you that's right, and, and and your first time here was in connection with what issue? Uh, just a, a general SCCR that we were following, and in fact, uh, then on the agenda was still a possible instrument for the protection of non non original databases. Oh yeah, that's right. It's an issue I know. Which eventually fell off the bus. <laughs> yeah, we were happy to see that disappear. Um, uh, but when you were doing that, you were working for the International Publishers At Association. Point, I worked yeah. for, for the IPA, yes. Okay, and so you're a lawyer, and, and uh, was that your first job out of law school, working for the IPA? Uh, no, I, I, I did articles like most lawyers would do, and there I worked for a firm in Zurich, um, and they had a strong footing in the copyright field in broadcasting. Uh, sports rights and, and publishing as well, working for a prestigious, uh, on, a, on a prestigious uh, publisher in Switzerland that I basically started on the same day as the former in-house counsel to that publisher and she was much uh, more experienced, took me under her wing and that was kind of it. I never looked back. <laughs> So, when you were studying law as a student, did you think you were going to be working in the area of intellectual property or I, I copyright? Never, no, I never heard about uh, copyright <laughs> as a student. Um, I, uh, I, well, I might have heard about it, mm -hmm. but I never thought about it. And only when, when doing the apprenticeship in a law firm, that's when I realized this is a really interesting field with many creative people in it. Um, Often it's important who you work with rather than what the subject is about and the people I found quite fascinating. Did, did you uh, ever have course packs when you were a, a student? <laughs> uh, I did and uh, in, in uh, Switzerland we mostly use, uh, used at the time, it was still a physical bricks and mortar library, the library we had an agreement uh, in, in retrospect I never knew about it as a student with the local collecting society um, that cost, I think, 16 francs per student, um, as I later found out. Um, and so course packs were kind of accounted for. But the, the method of tuition in Switzerland wasn't primarily course packs driven. It was primarily uh, teacher driven. I'm sorry, the teacher collected the, the well, tuition the teacher, the, but Basically, in, when I studied, it was it was very different from today. The teacher in the first day of the of the year would come with ten or fifteen books under his arm or her arm and say, "This is the exam. You don't need to attend classes if you want to pass the exam. Just read these books. You'll pass the exam. Um, but if you want to have fun, if you want to learn something of, about real life." 
you're very welcome to attend my class. <laughs> <laughs> that was the type of teachers we had and it was very enjoyable. And where was that? Did you study law? Basel University. Okay. Now you're here, you, you're, you're, uh, this week we're working on uh, copyright limitations and exceptions yeah. and the Treaty for the Protection of Broadcasting Organizations. Which of the issues here have you followed the closest? I followed the closest the possible uh, treaty on the visual, visual impairment and print disability that some, uh, that, that, that some consider the most mature. In terms of relevance, commercial relevance to the SDM body, and its members clearly library archives and education exceptions are, are kind of striking at the heart of the business that they are in but given the way things progress the instrument for the, for the visually impaired is, is the most advanced and so I focused on that. I noticed in reading the text that was released this morning as the, uh, the working, working document uh, there were brackets around the word scientific in terms of the definition of the work. Was that something that you asked them to put in the text? Actually, no. I, I, I followed the interventions and it seemed that some of the African group countries were in doubt whether literary works as a definition would also include scientific works. In SDM we have no doubt that it would and they insisted on scientific being there. We have we have no no quarrel with that whatsoever. So you don't know who tried to take it out then, was it? Who Could tried to take it out? I think it's it's Nigeria or maybe even I can't now remember whether India supported Nigeria. I think Nigeria wanted it in, and I think there's simply no agreement for it to be in. But we we would certainly not object to it being in. Maybe it's maybe somebody thought if you start adding one, then you have to add everything. So maybe right. it's maybe it's just going it's back to the Berne Convention. Neat, neat yeah. And short, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> it's not always sometimes in drafting. I guess that's what I mean, they have lawyers for. We, we, <laughs> we sometimes had opposite problems, which may may interest um, you. That people claim that scientific works should not be protected by copyright at all. So in fact, um, if if people think they should be, we are we're all in favor of that. <laughs> Now I think you, you, I thought that you took a, a fairly moderate position when they asked for the NGOs to intervene as it relates to the issue of exceptions for people with visual disabilities. But one thing I wasn't quite sure about was whether or not you, what your position was on the nature of the instrument. As you know, most, uh, all of the disabilities groups and all of the NGOs on my side working on these access to knowledge things are quite clear that they expect the instrument to be a treaty and we're frustrated right. by the fact that that's still being negotiated after all these years. What is uh, the position of your organization on that issue? The, the position is to some extent ambiguous. We, we stick to the uh, expression enabling legal framework which would be broad enough to, to be either an instrument or a treaty we understand that the interest groups are presenting that those with disabilities would prefer a treaty and we, we, we are not per se opposed to such a solution but that would mean it would have to have the right narrow wording. At the moment I don't think we're, we're quite there so it's a bit of a perhaps long answer um, take all the brackets out, can I sign this off for STM as a treaty? Answer no. Uh, can I imagine that there will be a text resulting where, where for STM I could sign off treaty? Yes, yes I can imagine that. Okay, so I can appreciate that's probably the same position that we feel, <laughs> depending on how the brackets fall, right? <laughs> probably. It, 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 it really is in the end a substantive discussion, <laughs> luckily. I mean, there, there are pros and cons for for you, for those representing disabilities and for us, with both a recommendation and a treaty. The pro for a recommendation is it would be a much faster process. It would be kind of automatically probably binding on, on everyone, whether they put a signature somewhere or not. So it would uh, automatically... So it, to some uh, extent there could be an advantage. So, so in the United States where it's illegal to export because uh, to anyone who's not a US resident, it would change that law? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on the U.S. law. My, my impression is that the U.S. is quite slow to accept self-executing instruments. I mean, even the Berne Convention it wasn't considered self-executing 
uh, we had to find that out in the litigation. So you're saying if it's a recommendation, it's even better than a treaty because you don't even have to change the law, it just changes the laws of everyone who signs well, it? Well, I, I would say in some respects it's, it's better because faster and kind of almost like a hoover, you get, you get all the countries in one go. But if On ever, the other hand, the yeah. treaty is clearly the instrument of choice and today from the interventions of people representing people with disabilities we hear that they really care also about the symbolism they they would like a treaty to be fully recognized as as people who have been respected in their in their justified interests and so i can understand that too that, that there is value in this too but you're saying that if if, if you have a recommendation that would actually change domestic law in countries, even if it's not ratified at the national level? I think that's a distinct possibility. I mean, the, the, a re recommendation... <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of... Okay, I'm saying, my eyebrows go, are raised on this end go, of the camera. If you go the treaty way, if you go yeah. the treaty way, you would have to have a national implementation. People would have to actually sign up. It would be a whole process with a recommendation there is no actual process of ratification. I know, but I mean, I understand that yeah. I, I could make a recommendation tomorrow and it would be really fast and I could do it. Yeah. But there's no, like I could say, Carlo, do you mind like standing on your head for 10 minutes, you know? <laughs> there's no guarantee you're going to start standing on your head if I give the recommendation. I mean, what, what makes you think that Canada's going to repeal the copyright law they just passed, the United States is going to amend its law and all these things without any legislators showing up and voting on anything? I mean, how does a rec what by what magic does a recommendation make these things happen? Well, a, a recommendation could influence how a judge interprets national law. If a national legislature or someone, the government says, we believe that our law already complies with the recommendation, we believe it can be read in that way, the US law could be read in the way that it allows imports or exports, um, if you have these type of statements, a court could later conclude that, you know, the recommendation needs to be looked at to interpret national law, and that way it could be automatically applicable by can, way of, of judge, by judges interpreting the national law differently. Can, can, can anyone make these kind of recommendations? Maybe the World Blind Union can make no, no, this no, no, recommendation. No, I mean, <laughs> a recommendation by me is different, you know, from the recommendation from 188 countries. Uh, obviously, so it's not like the word recommendation. There's no magic in that word. Okay, so the key is to get the, a UN body yeah. to unanimously, without any objection, approve something. Now, it just strikes me, and catch me if I'm wrong in this, is that if you want to get the whole world to say something with not a single country objecting, you might have to make a few compromises to get it in that form. Well, that's inevitable yeah. with a large group of people with this totally different interests. Um, that's so the is, nature of UN bodies. So, for example, the WCT, which is the World the WIPO Copyright Treaty in 1996, right. was not a unanimously adopted by people. It was it was agreed by some countries, but not by other countries. On the other hand, it created these binding obligations on countries who signed the agreement to do certain things and change the laws in certain ways. Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm following you. Well, what I mean is, is that, I mean, I, I, there has to be some boundaries on what you can achieve politically on something that goes through as a recommendation on the one hand, right. and there has to be some pretty severe limits on, 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 on the actual, uh, you know, the actual self-actualization. I mean, you can't really expect quite a few countries to, to look at a recommendation that takes place in Geneva at this body as something that really has changed the black letter provisions of their own laws. Right. I, I, I don't know about that. I, I think... I think you can. I think, in some respects, um, a, 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 the treaty route has the advantage of concentrating people's minds more. I think they, they will be much more careful in what words they choose. I think the stakes are higher. I think that's the advantage of, of going a tr down a treaty road. Mm -hmm. But that inevitably also means having to to forge consensus and it also means that after getting through here you will have a phase of national implementation which which will not be just like overnight as people presented here you know like a, by the stroke of a pen 
this treaty will apply in 188 countries. It will not be like that. It will, it will require national grind, ultimately. I, I, I just have one more. One, I'm sorry, because I promised you a short interview. <laughs> well, I'm sure you will edit it, uh, hopefully, uh, which underscores the, the role of the publisher. Well, I... <laughs> Uh, but I, the question I had, this is a separate question, which is that uh, one of the issues here is the three-step test. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I know you have a, probably have an answer for this, but a lot of people say, well, they, the countries that are, are part of the WTO system, they have to abide by the three-step test on reproduction that's found in the Berne Convention. And if they join, uh, and the WTO has some limitations in how you can depart from the provisions of the Berne Convention, right. which is a separate three-step test, and yet there's, and there's a third three-step test that exists in the, um, in the uh, WCT and the WPPT, mm -hmm. uh, even the Beijing treaties. Yep. So uh, all these copyright laws have different versions of this and trade agreements, and then you have all these regional trade agreements, and so they're all worded a little bit differently. Um, uh, why don't you just not have an argument about the three-step test here because uh, they're already confined by what they can do within the parameters of those other agreements anyhow. We did think about this, that in essence one could remove the three-step test from, from, from the text of this instrument and have it just in a preamble, for instance and says in French, ça va de soi, that this is self-evident, uh, everybody continues to be bound by the three-step test. Or, or just by whatever, I mean, or whatever bound, agreement they're bound. That's right, whatever and agreements you signed, right? Now, Without prejudice the, to the other agreements, the, right? Here is the complexity in bringing this important issue to, to WIPO. The, the discussions that are taking place on library uh, education, research, archive exceptions are coloring to some extent what we would like to see in the VIP instrument because um, it seems that the interest groups are presenting libraries and, and, and archives and research groups look to this instrument almost as a blueprint and, and saying like we want the same whatever it is whatever whatever the print disabled get we want the same and so we are very wary of, of, of these type of expectations. So it's again partly a, a symbolic issue. If we can be sure through the record that the 188 countries agree uh, that the yardstick remains the three-step test for exceptions and limitations, including those for uh, print disabled, the issue goes away. But from the floor we heard quite the contrary. Many people believe that the three-step test is a real problem and that they would like to see it changed. And that kind of rate changes the, the debate. Are you talking about uh, you mean changing the interpretation of the three-step yeah, test? Yeah, changing the interpretation or saying it's not really, it doesn't really have three steps and actually it's only one step and it's not really a test. So kind of watering it down through, yeah, giving it a different meaning. Well, I think if, if, I mean, I think if the publishers insist on having a lot of text that mentions the three-step test, people are going to want to have some pushback, and they're going to want to have their own interpretations so they're comfortable. I, actually, that actually happened in the WCT. I mean, when I read the WCT, it has one paragraph that says if you depart from the three-step, you know, uh, from right. the provisions of the treatment, you have to apply a three-step test, a different three-step test than was found in the burn. Then they have another paragraph that, that, that applies um, to the Berne Convention, which is different than the, the, than the other test, which is worded differently. And on top of everything else, they have an agreed upon statement in Article 10, which, uh, which uh, was actually a subject, having been, in, having been in Geneva in 1996, I can tell you it was part of a big part of the negotiation at the time. So, I'm sure it would have been. Uh, so, so I'm just saying if you bring the three-step test into this negotiation, don't be surprised if lots of things about the three-step test become part of the same negotiation. Yeah, I guess that, that, that one shouldn't be surprised about it. I, 
So I, my, I, I, so I what, was I'm, hopeful in, in the earlier yeah. statements, the Worldwide Union stated that they had no issue with the three-step test. Um, can I, can I, can, can, heard, can, yeah. Okay, let me just give you like a perspective on this. The Berne Convention has a three-step test only in the reproduction right. And the reproduction right is considered kind of a fundamental right in the thing, and so it's thought to be quite important. But, uh, uh, and apparently that was added when the Stockholm Protocol for Developing Countries came about in 67. That's what someone said this week. Mm -hmm. Now, taking it back, back a step, the Berne has several exceptions, which are different than the, uh, uh, than the reproduction right, which is a nine. They have uh, in Article 10, Right. Quotations in education, they have Article 2, BIS, they have Article 10, BIS, they have these different articles that have different standards like fair practice, or remuneration, right. or things like that. It's, it's our interpretation, and what the people from the WTO has said is that when the burn sets out a particular standard for an exception, that prevails over the general three-step test in the reproduction right. And that, uh, 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 so the three-step test applies if there's nothing else that applies, but when when the burn does provide a particular, and if you look at the areas where the the burn has special exceptions, they're really important to people like our groups. There are things like quotations, reporting news events, education, things like that. And it's not like they have uh, in in Article 10. It's not like they have no standards. They have different standards, like fair practice, uh, consistent with the uh, the purpose, or something like that. And, and the reason I, I mention all this is it's, it's a highly technical, trickle, the, tricky yes. part. I just don't see the utility in getting a bunch of blind people in the middle of what's a bunch of law professors battling over the languages on the three-step test. I mean, it's, it's, it's highly technical, it, and, and, and there's sort of a folklore which isn't really grounded well in the technical part of the, of the legal things. And this is going to become a nasty trade discussion about technical things around Blind, a blind people's exception, which is uncontroversial, where it's found in in, 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 in Europe and the United States. I mean, nobody really even, no, 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 it's an uncontroversial, I mean, why make it controversial when its origin is non-controversial? Is it just because you're in the same building where they're discussing something else that's more controversial, like education? Okay. Um well, first on the on the interpretation, um, my understanding was the three the three step test was actually a quid pro quo for inserting the reproduction right into that version of the Berne Convention of Stockholm, and it is a later addition compared to the other exception standards you mentioned. So one could argue that the later law, to the extent that the affects the reproduction right in the Berne Convention um, prevails and the other important exceptions and, and their standard remain important where they go to adaptation or republication because typically those other exceptions are uh, linked to a creative process like quotation in a new work, inclusion in an, in a, of, an, of current events inside a published or a, a broadcast new work. So um, I think there, there are several readings that are possible there. The, that's the technical aspect. The, the, the harmonization effect of the three-step test I think is positive. In essence it's the common denominator. If, if countries um, are at different levels of development and growing and um, developing at different speeds to unify and cast in stone exceptions. I'm not sure it's such a great idea. So the three-step test being a yardstick of an exception rather than, than an exception itself allows for that flexibility. So I would argue that, that it still today is, is a great harmonizing factor. A standard rather than a cast in stone fixed uh, exception. Have you read the one WTO case on the three-step test, the 2000 decision involving uh, the United States Copyright Code? Uh, the, the one on the Irish pubs? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I, I have read it. I mean, my take on that was that the reason the three-step test was used in that particular case was because the U.S. was using an exception which was not found among the burn exceptions. 
because they were not providing remuneration right. and that they said that if the remuneration had in fact been uh, offered, yes. that, the, uh, that the, 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 the challenge to the law would have failed. It was the lack of remuneration. But right. th in that particular case, for that particular article of the burn, uh, the interpretation I read into that was the three-step test applied when there was not a particular exception. Right. But maybe I'm sure there's a, yeah. deep, a deeper level of sophistication on that than I, I'm picking up as an on lawyer. But no, no, I think I think you're right. The, the three-step test applied by virtue of the, the trips agreement as a, as an overarching test for any any kind of. But what I'm saying is non-existent that, other exception. Exactly. But what? But also the implication from the from the from the text of the uh, text of the opinion was that had they actually followed the the. the uh, a burn, a burn provided exception that the three-step test would not have been used. It's possible, I must say, um, that it's probably a still, still an open question. As, as I say, you, you can argue either way. You can say the, the, the more special law should apply, or you can say the later law should apply. Um, I'm not sure that for the Irish pub that needed to be decided because. Plainly, that wasn't a quotation. It wasn't. A, it wasn't any of the recognised instances. But we're fighting over the recognised instances. That's the thing. That's right. So <laughs> I'm saying you can argue either way. You can say it's the later law, or it's mm. it's the more specialised law. So see, I think I think. Uh, but but the harmonising yeah. effect. If we, we people here, actually, to my surprise. The, the, those who, who would like to see instruments on libraries and re education argue that we need greater harmonization of exceptions in, in globally. Um, th that in itself sounds reasonable, but when you analyze that's it... Not, that's, that's not, as you know, it's not necessarily KEI's position on yeah, things. I, I, didn't, I don't exactly yeah. know your position. Yeah. When you, people have tried this before and the best they came up with in the end was three-step test saying Yes, we are now in an increasingly borderless world, but we still have differences. We have different levels of development. We have different, different values, frankly, even. Um, as much as we might wish to overlook that, we still are in, in, in a diverse uh, cultural world where people have different needs for exceptions. But, but I must say, I'm a big fan of 2BIS, of uh, 10 1, 10 2, 10 bis, those sort of things. I mean, I find quite a bit there in the in the burn exceptions, and that's a form of harmonization. Right. Like a quite, in fact, you'd have to say that 10 1 is a, is, is a high level of harmonization because it's a mandatory exception. Which also brings me, if you talk about the people in the scientific field, it seems yeah. to me that the, the people that, the, 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 that are authors whose works that you publish or that your clients publish, seems to me that they should be. Uh, they should they, they should be quite grateful for the uh, specific provisions of the trips, which allows you to uh, not enforce copyright or have exceptions in the areas of uh, certain lectures and uh, in terms of uh, certain current events, breaking news, news right. certain kinds of uh, broadcast, uh, the liberal interpretations that you see in Europe on the quotation right things. Those things seem Absolutely. to be things that are beneficial to the creative yes. industry itself. So. I think of the, the the publishing industry itself as as not as as, as a as a cons as a user of exceptions. Absolutely. Not just we, the we end are, users. Yeah, we we are uh, the, the publishers I represent are in a in an interesting situation in that they are both users and owners of rights. And as you rightly say, part of the creative process is also the reuse of works. And in that sense, publishers are often users and benefit from some, some exceptions as well. And at STM we also have created the STM permission guidelines which go well beyond what, what would be permitted by exceptions to facilitate uh, authors uh, building on each other's works and, and we're, 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 not, we're not opposed to that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, wind up the interview pretty yeah. quick here, but, but you've been really, really gracious and, and generous with your time and, 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 to, and to engage in a very, uh, I'd have to say, substantive discussion on a really controversial topic without any um, 
reservations in it. We're, we're, we're very grateful for that. And, uh, but I'd like to offer you the opportunity if you want to add anything else before we conclude the interview. Well, just to thank you for, for the interview. And, uh, you know, we, we, we may agree to disagree on, on substantive issues, but that doesn't take away from, you know, uh, how, how I think of you as a, as a person, of the organization. And I think what was interesting this week, last week, is to the th everyone in there wanted to improve the world, every single person, and, and that's, that's the positive. We may disagree how best to achieve that. Okay, thanks Carl. <laughs>